Hey, Bruce. Gentlemen. Henry, how are you? Good, how are you? Can you run here? Yeah, we're being on vacation. 7 p.m. Monday, September 13th, 2021. I'd like to call to order the City of Laconia City Council meeting. Uh, this meeting is being held live in the Armand Bolduck City Council Chamber, City Hall. There is a Zoom link which would allow you to uh, participate as well. Webinar ID 825-9914-4553. Passcode 788538. If you'd like to listen only, you may call in 1646-558-8656. Uh, this meeting is also will also be on YouTube, which is www.youtube.com forward slash Laconia NH. <clears throat> So uh, before we go any farther, I would like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask uh, Councilor Hamill if he would lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilor Hamill. Thank you. We are joined at council table this evening by city clerk, Cheryl Hebert. And I'd ask the city clerk, the recording secretary to call the roll. Councilor Cheney. Here. Councilor Susie. Here. Councilor Littman. Here. Councilor Haynes. Here. Councilor Hamill. Present. Councilor Felt. Here. Mayor Hosmer. Mayor Hosmer is here as well. Full attendance, just terrific. Also at council table this evening is city manager Scott Myers, and we also have finance director helping us on IT uh, once again, and that's Glenn Smith. So moving uh, along on the agenda this evening, uh, which is uh, under item 7A, regular meeting minutes of August 23rd, 2021. Minutes of the meeting were distributed to the city council on Friday, August 27th, 2021. With no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk, the minutes will be accepted as distributed. Uh, in the same vein, we have special meeting minutes of August 30th, 2021. Minutes of <clears throat> that meeting were distributed to the City Council on Tuesday, August 31st, 2021. With no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk, the minutes will be accepted as distributed. Moving along to item number eight on our Agenda, which is uh, consent and action items. 8A is temporary traffic order 2021-15, which is the Laconia High School homecoming parade. A request for a temporary traffic order for the high school homecoming parade from 4 to 6, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. on September 24th, 2021. So we'll be looking for a motion right now to approve the, this temporary traffic order 2021-15. Laconia High School Homecoming Parade to be held on September 24th, 2021 from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. So made by Councillor Hamill, seconded by Councillor Felch. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hands. That's six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. We're on to item nine right now, which is citizens comments for matters not on the agenda. <coughs> so if you would like to step right up to the microphone, Introduce yourself. If you're a city resident, let us know maybe what ward you live in. And anyone on Zoom as well can raise their hand and Mr. Smith will acknowledge you and we'll get you get you going as well. Welcome. Okay. I'm Lisa McElrath Popeck. I live both in um, 192 Holman Street, but I'm here concerning 20 and 22 Willow Street. Um, 20 is in Ward 2, which I thought it was in Ward 6, so I talked to the wrong councilman, but he was very helpful. So um, I'm here for two reasons. One, I need to make a formal request for uh, the report from the Colonial Adjustment Insurance 
Brandon Robertson did um, for when they had the flood on Willow and Hill Street. Um, I was told that it was a direct um, issue because of the pipe that Parks put in um, that caused the flooding, at least in my place. But then I put in, actually I didn't, the town put in for me, um, at least this Brandon guy put in, sorry, I'm just nervous. That's quite, a, that's no problem at all. Um, Take your time. Put a claim in through, from the town put the claim in for me through travelers. Um, I don't know if it's a legit company or not. I called twice and I got a response um, that said traveler insurance and then said, hello, hello, anybody there? I'm here, I'm here. And then it goes to an answering machine. Um, I called back thinking again, maybe there's, maybe someone was on the other line and I got the same thing. So I left a message and I also emailed saying, um, that we had talked with this Brandon Robertson through the town. And um, I did get a phone call, but only one ring and it hung up. They left no message. Besides that, I have had no response from travelers. Um, the other issue is Willow Street. During that time, I called and talked to Wes Ander Anderson um, and he was actually the first one that told me about the pipe being the incorrect size and that it caused, and it wasn't the town. Um, he came down with the adjuster. I didn't have a pleasant experience with him. The adjuster was very polite and nice. Um, he stood out in the middle of the road and explained, I we then later got on the topic about when is our street going to be paved and he kept saying when the project will be done in November the project and he said it many times and he said it to other neighbors as well the project will be finished in November um, he stood out in the middle of the road right after the flood when it dried before they cleaned there had to be at least three inches of soot and rocks I spent a week cleaning, it ruined my floor, it uplifted the cement and everything. So that's why I put, was gonna put a claim in. But then he was standing out in the middle of the road and he told me that the trucks are not using our road, only when they can't go down any other road, it's not possible. He said, so it's only been a couple of times. I said, that's not true, I've sat here and counted many times I have several pictures and you can ask many of the contractors because they've come and asked why I'm taking pictures. Um, <clears throat> he stood out in the middle of the road when the road was covered with soot and said this, it's obvious that these big trucks are not caused undermining the road. And I finally had it. And I just essentially said to him that anyone with any type of intelligence would know a truck going down the road full of rocks and dirt is gonna undermine the road. When I finally specifically asked him, I just wanna know when our roads and our sidewalks are gonna be done, cause I've been trying for maybe 10 years to get them done. He finally said, your street isn't slated to be done. So I, I think it should be slated. I, after that, talked with um, Sean Anderson and he came down and he said, yes, we are using your road primarily. He did start going around, but whenever I went out with pictures, they would stop. Um, Sean Anderson. He is the owner of Parks but he introduced himself as Bruce. And then he said, his name is Anderson. But when I went and talked to his worker down the street, they said, no, his name isn't Bruce, it is Sean. But I had written it down right then and there. So it's not a mistake, which is kind of weird. Um, I then called Tony Felch because I thought he was my representative. He was very helpful, came over, looked, I showed him the stuff, I explained it. I said, I had a tenant break her wrist two, maybe three winters ago, 
reported it to the town to actually West Anderson and he gave her a hard time. She was just asking them to come over and salt. I had the previous worker, I don't recall his name before West Anderson. So that has to be six, seven years ago, even before the park issue um, with parking, come over and took pictures and said, yes, you have there's drainage issues and there's also, um, it's called the skirt or the apron. I don't remember what it is of the road. We have now, I think at least nine children living on that street that have to, they walk and it's dangerous. It's, it's the sidewalks are terrible. Um, and I'd like to know when our street's gonna be done. Thank you very much for, um, Sure. sharing what sounds like a really frustrating experience. Um, yeah. So um, thank you. And this all started to occur. What, when was the flood? I believe it was the 29th because I had tenants of coming in 29th of July. I had tenants moving out and other tenants moving in on the first because it's crazy out there. You can get tenants, but I was unable. They declined it. They saw the area, declined it wanted their security deposit back, wasn't gonna keep their security deposit for something they didn't do incorrectly. Um, gave the security deposit, did find another renter, but it took another two weeks. After that, parks or the town, I'm not sure, I had said, I'm gonna be showing the place. I can't show it in this condition. And they did clean the street and it took all day for them to clean the street. Um, I did get another renter, but I lost a month's rent. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So uh, it, you're in Ward 2, is that correct? So you're my guy. So Councillor Susi would be your guy. Thank so you, to speak, Tony. In the for council. Sorry. <clears throat> I appreciate it. My that. representative. So that would, be, that would be probably a direct contact for some assistance right there. Yeah. I know okay. he'd be just as... And I tried you council. today. Yeah. I, I, I Thank you. Yes, I did see that. Um, and probably just as much help as Councillor Felch. I, I don't know if this is something that maybe you'd like to address right now, just to give us just a, a little bit of insight on this. Yes, very, very briefly. So this took place during the heavy rain that we had on July 29th and mm -hmm. crews were out there. We did, and I apologize, I, I missed your name when you spoke at all. I, Lisa McElrath Popek. Thank you. Um, so Lisa is was one of the properties impacted. The city has filed claims. We, we use a firm called Primex, which is a public uh, risk insurance management. It's a pooled risk um, for a lot of municipalities. So Travelers is not our company that maybe somebody parks so shoes or, so, or somebody else. So um, uh, Lisa was in my office today at around 1130 speaking with Nancy and requesting the report. So I'm sure Nancy put that right into John Gardner who handles our insurance and purchasing and we have her contact information and we'll be following up with her regarding the road condition. Willow was not originally meant to be paid, but we can certainly assess the conditions in that area as we get to um, the latter part of this construction. Uh, I don't know the timing wise, whether it's something that um, if it warranted, it would be completed this year or not, but we certainly can assess uh, the road condition um, down there. So uh, Nancy does have the information and we will be following through on the report that she requested, but she was just in the building today for the first time that that my office oh. has, has heard. I've been talking to them since. Un understood. I'm just saying from this yeah. morning was the first from time US. I believe you've been yeah. in my office. So. so Lisa, thank you very much. And uh, just to shed some light, Travelers is a legitimate insurance company. It sounds as if you may have had a bad number, but. Um, it's uh, the number that's on their letter. And I left really? you a copy of that as well. Looks like they have a bad number, don't they? Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing I did is I had called, I believe there might be, I'm not positive, I've had another property, but I thought there was a drain in my backyard. If so, it's not there anymore or it's covered over. I asked um, West Anderson if he could, he said, oh, we tried when we were cleaning the back because he, he said, there's no record of it, but it looks like someone was digging, looking for it. But I said, is there um, a metal detector? And I guess he told me to call Moody and I called several people and I guess you guys don't have a metal detector, which I kind of find hard to believe. Well, how about this, Lisa? It sounds like you've been frustrated an awful lot and probably time. put a lot of time and energy into this. So. Perhaps uh, myself and Councillor uh, Susie can make a time to get together with um, the city manager and get over there sometime this week if your schedules permit and take a look around and see if we can get a better understanding and 
and get some resolution that you're satisfied with. It sounds like it's been a, a long, too, it's gone on a little too long. And certainly I, yes. I appreciate you coming here and sharing your frustrations with it. I think if I were in your shoes, I'd be less patient than you've been, but right. we're well, happy to help. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Okay. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's not the only property we have the challenge with. Another property up on Clinton Street. Mr. Myers is aware of this, okay? Same, similar problem, flooding through the basement and all the area, and the insurance companies were all saying, no, no, no. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's more than just one. Okay. All right. Yeah, so and I, they're also saying that um, I understand, because I talked to my insurance and about flooding and that the grounds were saturated. But if you look at the video, and I can always share the video, which I couldn't believe you wouldn't have a copy of the videos and the pictures of it coming down the street, it wasn't just a flood, but they said something about a dam or a wall that broke up there. So but, but if maybe we could do a little bit of research on that and find yeah. out the history there of the property in the area. Yeah. So get a better understanding of maybe what happened during the 29th when it did flood yeah. and, and then see if we can assist you in and with the claim as well. Okay. okay. And the only other time I had a flood that flooded like up to the basement, our neighbor had it before was when um, some dam broke several years ago. Um, and I didn't put a claim in then, but I'm sure you guys have it on record somewhere. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we will follow up in the in the next couple of days and, and get out there, take a look around, see if okay. we can help you a bit. Okay. Thank you very much. And I thank appreciate you. your time. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. Anyone else in the uh, chamber? Good evening. Welcome. Mayor, Council. Good evening. Scott McWilliams, 61 Pearl Street. Uh, Mayor, I seem to recall a while back you had uh, appointed a commission or committee to look into the homeless issue here in Laconia, and I haven't heard a lot about it since. I maybe have missed some things, but I would ask if council could ask that commission to have a report to council sometime here in the next near future to keep us up to date with what kind of solutions maybe there coming up with or their findings or just to keep us up to date on what's going on with that commission and that situation. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And if you can send your email address along to me, I'll make sure that you're included on, on any updates or invitations. I'm, I, I'm gonna forget that in three seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. So, thank you, Cheryl's right. got it, but thank Let's you very that. much, but okay. I'll make thank sure you. that you're included, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Anyone online? That will conclude citizens' comments for matters not on the agenda. Uh, moving along to item number 13, which is our public hearings portion. Item number 13A, uh, which is a, uh, for, um, we are requesting a public hearing for proposed ballot question for a charter <coughs> amendment. Um, Notice of this public hearing was made available in the September 1st, 2021 edition of the Laconia Daily Sun and posted at City Hall, Laconia Public Library, Community Center, and the SAU. Uh, a little background on this is the city is required to review and adjust its ward boundaries if needed after the release of the 10-year federal census data. Because of COVID-19, the data, which is usually released in the spring, was delayed until the summer this year. Detailed local, da local data is still not available at this time. The recommended changes to ward boundaries will not be completed in time to place the matter on the municipal election ballot on November 2nd, as would be the norm. Not having the question on that particular ballot will necessitate the city holding a special election, most likely in January, for this one specific item. To avoid the cost and inconvenience of holding this special election, an alternative approach to approving ward boundaries is being proposed. This approach would have the city council set boundaries after a duly noticed public hearing and with a two-third majority vote threshold. 
There is no fiscal impact in moving this question to the no in moving this question to the November 2021 ballot. If the question is approved by the voters, the city will not have to incur the cost of holding a special election in all six wards. After opening and closing the public hearing, action on this item uh, may be taken up under unfinished business this evening. So I'd like to open the public hearing at 7.21 p.m. And if anyone would like to make a comment on this, now would be the appropriate time. Councilor Lippman. I just, for, before people may be interested in testifying, I think that we talked about that um, when this matter came up, there would be a plan that the public would be able to look at and testify on, not just that it's assigning it to the council to develop the, the boundaries. So uh, thank you. Once the boundaries are set, <clears throat> the public will have uh, notice and an opportunity to look at them and comment on the boundaries. Right. So they're yes. not, I just want to clarify, there's a distinct difference between appointing the council to establish the boundaries versus putting a plan out there and getting comment and then making a decision. Thank you very much. Patrick. Mr. Mayor, Councilors, Patrick Wood, 717 Shore Drive. Just for clarification, this would be an amendment that would be a permanent amendment to the charter, and this would be the process every time there's a census. Is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? No, I don't. I don't see that as as, as the case here. I think there's a timing issue associated with the cens census. Right. Because so, the, uh, so this is a one-time yes. change. That's the understanding. Necessitated okay. by the data being delayed because of a backup on COVID-19. Right. Okay. Yes, but, uh, I don't think so. I think no. you're wrong. It, it, if, if I could, Mr. Mayor, if you're amending the charter, are you not allowed to put sunset provisions in the charter? So this would be a change to the charter. It could be changed back at the next municipal election to go back that way, but it would take another charter question to do that. We're hopeful that this is a one-time issue with the data. I think I made that mistake time. last time. So, anyway. Okay. Third Thank time you. will be a charm. Anyone online? Um, Any other comment from council? Come right up. Mark Porgioni, Ward 4. I just have a question on why it needs to be a charter. Don't you already have the power to, to change the boundaries? No. The, the boundaries are set by the voters and it's a part of our charter. There are some communities that vest that authority in the city council to make adjustments on a 10 year cycle with the data. And again, after a duly advertised and noticed public hearing and an opportunity for comment, our charter, if you go to the very first section of it, it breaks down that these are the ward boundaries. So every 10 years, traditionally, the voters would um, vote to make adjustments as warranted by the population shifts. Um, but because of the, the delay in the data, which is usually out in the spring, would give us an opportunity to work out in the summer, get something together, hold, hold the meetings, hold the public hearings, get the public input, get the charter amendment question when the new boundaries approved and off to the appropriate state agencies um, who have 30 days to respond to them and then get them on a ballot. Um, that, that time allotment is not available to us this year because the data is not gonna be dropped in the detail that we need from the US Census Bureau until September 30th. And by that point, we already, for the most part, need to have our ballots finalized because they need to go to the printer to get the proof. And then we need to have them back in time in order to distribute absentee ballots. So it's really not the November 2nd date that we're up against. It's probably like an October 10th date. And if the data is not coming out to the 30th, there just isn't the physical time to post the meetings, advertise a public hearing, which needs a minimum of seven days before you can hold it and get all the work done to get it on a ballot. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Anyone online? Mr. Smith? Thank you. I'd like to close the public hearing at 7.25 p.m. Uh, moving along very briefly, uh, to the mayor's report. Uh, uh, the only thing I'd like to comment on this evening is tomorrow is primary day. Uh, polls will be open from eight until six. Not anything else. 
Uh, so encouraging everyone to certainly uh, go to the polls and take someone with you. Uh, participation is important. So that's all I have for the mayor's report this evening. Now is council comments. Do I have any councilors looking to perhaps make a comment this evening? One at a time, one at a time. <laughs> Seeing none, how about committee reports? Councilor Hamilton, it's nice to have you back. Thank you. Be back. Liaison reports? Any committee or liaison reports? Okay. Item number 19 this evening is um, citizens' request to comment on current agenda items. Come forward. Good evening. My name is Robert Sawyer. I own the building on Canal Street, 50 to 62 Canal Street. I've owned it for almost 40 years and, and paid taxes and have made considerable investments in bringing it to the condition that it's in. What I'm most concerned about, and having been my family, having been in Laconia as retailers for 75 years, feels like I've been there the 75 years, but it's really only 50, um, is the fact is, is that we're on the precipice of losing more to our parking. And I know that the, the council thinks that parking is important because they purchased the, um, the property across the street from the post office for parking. But that in my mind is overflow parking and long-term parking. And when you look at some of the businesses that are downstairs, I'm gonna take, I mean downtown, I'm gonna take Canal Street. You have Trillium, large takeout business. Somebody needs to park, get, and leave. Ulala Cakes, somebody needs to pick up a cake and leave. You have the framing shop. Somebody needs to carry things. Some think times they're sizable things and leave. You have Penny Patu Travel. You have H Purse. You have a sushi, sushi shop. You have the cobbler. And so that's the character of that particular street. And that is somewhat the character of downtown. Now, the reason why I'm bringing the issue up is that I think you did a wonderful job in doing the theater. I just think it's great. Um, and I think it's wonderful that Rusty McClear decided to develop apartments on that same property. But there's a proposal, and I think it's already been negotiated um, even though there hasn't been a public hearing, that the spaces that are going to be dedicated for 99 years, 24 hours a day, are all in the two-hour parking zone. And there's nothing that says those two-hour spaces are going to be replaced. So if you take the Beacon Street East lot and you look at it most days, most days the unrestricted parking is filled. And someone is not going to come in and do a takeout lunch or something else with only a, with, with having to walk three blocks. And so these businesses that survived during COVID, these businesses that paid their rent during COVID, and this individual who paid his taxes during all of this um, are now going to be disadvantaged <clears throat> in favor of someone else. Now, I don't know who the buyers of those condominiums are going to be. I don't know if when they're carrying their groceries that one of the spaces on Canal Street couldn't be a 15 minute space for people to load and unload or whatever it's called. And that they park maybe a row behind. Maybe they park along the row by the post office. Obviously it has to be convenient they have to be spaces that are available to sell the units. But the fact is, is that those of us who've been here a long time, made a lot of investment financially, heart and soul, are just being forgotten. My understanding is this has all been negotiated, all done, and there I am across the street. There was no attempt to talk to me about the impact of what it is. So I think before the council does, takes away any two hour parking, I think they need to table any requests for specific parking spaces. I think you need to 
tell an individual who's doing a development who was led to believe that the city was going to provide spaces that you will do so. But I think it's it, it, premature and inappropriate at this point to designate specific spaces for 99 years. Later on, we're going to be discussing the parking garage. Maybe the best deal is to give somebody who's going to have an expensive condominium the opportunity to buy or rent or whatever the whatever the terminology is, a space in the garage. If I read the lease correctly, and I am not an attorney, it says the individuals are going to be able to have that space for 99 years, period. And I just think that that's just not in the best interest of the whole city. It may be in the best interest of a few individuals, but not in the best interest of everyone. And so that's why I ask that you not make that decision now, but I also want you to know, I think you did a great job with the theater. I'm glad you did the parking lot. I was a tenant of Rusty's in Meredith for 25 years. I've done business things with him. I'm excited that this is going on. I just don't want to see this unintended consequence. And Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. I appreciate you coming in this evening. Ask, and that's just- Can I ask him a question? Bob, I couldn't hear what you said. I wanted to make sure I could ask you a question, Bob. Okay. Oh, of course. Okay. My question is, so what would you recommend where the spaces go? Okay. What my first recommendation is, is that in total, we have no fewer two hour parking spaces than what we have now. Okay. And we're going to have 18 fewer if on this particular thing, two for. So you're saying put them someplace else but not the two hours and not in that visible one of the things that one of the comments that was made to me was the fact is that people can't see the row of spaces on beacon street east when the cars are parked in the angled parking i don't find that accurate because i walked over there um tonight and that area in front of those 10 spaces is striped off so that no one can park there so I think that it is visible. And I think that with parking and with customers and with people, perception becomes reality. And if people perceive there isn't a convenient parking space, they're going to go someplace else. And the whole idea of what we're all doing, the investments that Kevin Sullivan and I made, the investments that, that you made on behalf of all of us, are to try and make a lot of these small businesses viable. And, and I think you're by doing that, you're disadvantaging them. Okay. So what you're, what you're saying is the, and I'm, I can't be positive in my head, which row we're talking about. For the you're talking Beacon about Street. the front row on Beacon Street East. It's in the, it's right. in the, okay. in the lease. What you're saying is that if we take those two hour parking spaces away, we're hurting the businesses downtown. Those businesses that are adjacent to it. Yes. So if, if, if your recommendation, and maybe I've heard some other people in the, in the council chambers moving me the backwards or put them someplace else. Well, you know, even if you put them, you gave, uh, and, and please, I choosing my, I'm not no, the best no. at choosing my words. Right. You gave the spaces to Mr. Binney when he bought the old police station. Maybe if they're not the visible spaces in the front, it would be best. That really, that area along there really isn't that much further to walk. At one time, I did think it would that I wanted to see them move towards City Hall and done that. And there's a question as to walking, whether it's a shorter distance, which it is to walk down Canal Street. Um, you know, that it isn't an ideal situation, but I think tying things up for 99 years and and just and and having that many fewer spaces is done or. Worst case scenario, we've got to have more two-hour spaces. So if you take, take away those or you put that somewhere, don't just unilaterally do something. You know, those of us who are here that don't have big checkbooks should matter as well. You know, if I may one more question, sir. One more. I don't know if I really answered it. That's why I think it should be tabled so it would be studied. And I'd be glad to spend the – I happen to have the time at this point to sit and work with it. It, it didn't think my opinion was important because I haven't been asked before. So 
I'm asking to make my opinion important. It's the first time you've been shy that I know. Of in <laughs> no, I was unaware that. No, Henry. Uh, seriously, if, Rob, if I can, if I can you, respond to that, I knew that that in the process, in with the development, that there would be spaces. I never, in my wildest imagination, thought that would be the closest two hour spaces to the buildings. And I just found that about that, I believe it was Tuesday. And so I wasn't shy. I did call a council person and I spoke with one in the parking lot and I called Scott and I'm trying to do this in a, in a constructive way. That's where I am. So yeah, no, I, 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 I that, that that's my point. Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mayor, Councilors, uh, Patrick Wood, uh, 717 Shore Drive. Uh, I have a couple of um, issues that I want to talk about. One is the parking that's been designated for this, uh, the private spaces that we just heard from. Uh, I'm in 100% agreement with Mr. Sawyer on the impact of that. And I'll, I want to come back to that. The second issue I want to talk about is the parking garage. The first issue, if you can imagine your house or your business, and all of a sudden the city says, we're going to allow all these people to park in front of your place so that the post office cannot deliver mail to you anymore. What's your reaction going to be? Well, you're going to be quite upset. So you talk to the post office and they say, sorry, we can't deliver, we can't get to your space. So you have an option, you can always rent a post office box. But if you're a business and the city has taken away your parking spaces that you need for your customers, what are the customers going to do? They're not gonna come back. You've lost them. That's a major risk. So are there ways to deal with this? I think there are. I think one thing that you should consider is that if you're going to designate parking spaces, they should not be on uh, a, in a space that faces a sidewalk that benefits a specific building. For example, the spaces behind the Wayfarer. That's a major space for people to park for that particular business. And you're supposing or proposing four of those spaces to be designated. Now, if we said you can park in the center of that lot, fine. Or the center of the city hall parking lot, fine. But don't take, as Mr. Sawyer said, the two hour spaces that we need for our businesses. I think that's something that you really need to seriously consider. The second part of that is being a retired lawyer, I have some familiarity with the concept of equal protection. And if you're going to be designating parking spaces for one business or one property owner, why are you not going to allow that for every other property owner or business owner? You can't play favorites when you're the government. You have to treat everyone equally. And that's a problem with this proposal. I think there are solutions, but I think as Mr. Sawyer suggests, let's do a little bit more studying about this. Let's figure this out, try to do it right. One thing you all have said to the people downtown, and I was a merchant or a businessman downtown for a number of years, come back to us with your ideas for parking. Well, we're willing to do that. But what we are concerned about is with the city saying, we're not going to give you a choice in it, we're just going to take those spaces. So let's pull back a little bit, let's talk about it, let's think about it. We know there are solutions, we just don't have that solution right now. So that's my first issue. With regard to the parking garage, I mean, this is a problem that we've all been struggling with. Um, I am concerned 
in the most logical conclusion in uh, in my mind is let's just get rid of it, start over somehow, do something with it. But you can't just do that. We can't, for example, just take down the top of that uh, parking garage and make the roof, just the roof of those buildings. And why can't we do that? Because there are a number of people that use that for their parking, in particular, the beauty school. They tell all of their students this is where you're supposed to park. So what do we do about that existing business? Do we say to them, we're sorry, you can't be downtown because you don't have a place to park? We don't want to do that, I hope. We don't want to do that. So maybe a solution is to fix the ramp, but keep that space parking, take down the top part of it, but keep the parking uh, at least on that level, if we can. I don't know if that's feasible uh, from an engineering point of view. Uh, I know we had problems when I lived there. Uh, I say lived there. When I worked there, pretty much living there because that's what I was doing most of the time. Um, but we would like to at least think about, is there a way to keep that parking area if we can? I don't know. So those are my two concerns for this evening. If you have any questions that you think I might be able to answer, I'd be more than happy to try to do that. Thank you very much. Patrick. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. Any other comments, either online or in the chamber? There was an online member who's raised his hand. Terrific. Having to find his condos. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Can you hear us here uh, yes. online? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Terrific. Hi, Mark Conda Demetraki, uh, 8 Edgewater Avenue, Ward 3. I, I do apologize for not being able to make it there in person. And I do just want to briefly echo Mr. Wood's comments. Um, as a downtown business owner, my question is will this same plan be available? to uh, myself, obviously, and the other business owners um, in the downtown area, obviously being able to secure 18 parking spaces for a hundred year lease would be a very coveted thing to have and would certainly um, be something that, that you know we and other businesses would be very much interested in. And obviously that being said, if you have five or six businesses that wish to secure up to 18 parking spaces, before you know it, you have 100 parking spaces that are accounted for, and then what? So uh, that is pretty much my comment, and uh, would love to hear more about what this proposed plan is. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. Seeing no other requests to speak, we'll move along to item number 20, which is the city manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So included in your packet for uh, this first meeting of the month, we have your financial and operational trends. We'll start at the top of that first page, uh, looking at the building permit, uh, net gain and construction value, meaning new construction, less any demolition. You can see for the assessing year, which we follow, which is the state year beginning April 1st. So from April through the end of August, we are at $23 million in new value in building permits uh, pulled at this point net. Uh, similar period last year, uh, which was also a very busy year, was 13 and a half million. So almost an additional 10 million uh, pace ahead of last year at this time. It's very positive there. You can see the number of calls for the fire and rescue uh, for Laconia Fire Department uh, topped 500 uh, this month. And that's a, uh, a big jump specifically uh, when you compare the month of August over the last two years and even uh, exceeded a very high year back in 2018. We continue to see little fluctuations uh, or, or fluctuation, I should say, in our, our public assistance, our welfare office. Some of this is due to some monies that are being paid out that'll be reimbursed through some of the various programs. 
or some of the CDBG grants that we have right now, and they will true up as we go along. But as um, a lot of the programs were unwinding and new programs are coming in, sometimes people uh, are, are not having the safety net that they've been accustomed to in terms of utilities or evictions or, or other matters like that. So we continue to monitor that, but that'll be a, a little bit of flux in our welfare area as we go forward. Down to the bottom of the second page, our property tax collection continues to be very strong at over 97%. If you look back going all the way to 2014, that's the second strongest number that we uh, have during that time period here. Uh, motor vehicle registrations at the bottom of page two uh, continue to pleasantly surprise because you, you hear stories that there's no chips and therefore uh, car production is down and yet somehow um, residents are finding cars. And, and really when you look at the motor vehicle registration world, uh, if, you're, if you're trading in a less expensive or less valued model at this time for a more expensive model, that's when you will see the increase year over year. If, if folks hang on to their cars and nobody traded a vehicle, then we actually would see declining motor vehicle registration because the value goes down each year when your registration, a percentage of it is based on value. So to actually have uh, not only our projected revenue number be up $120,000 in this year's budget over last year's budget, but to be running the highest percentage collected pace uh, over the last six years, and in terms of just straight dollars, only two months into the year, we're almost $50,000 ahead of last year's pace, which was a record pace. So um, very interesting dynamics in play there, and I still continue to scratch my head when I see those numbers. Uh, the overtime page on page three, nothing jumping out here as being um, out of line. You probably see a little bit more time being used in the vacation arenas for the months of July and August, which is more the typical norm, uh, and I think more so this year than the past years that were, were um, at least had started to get out of out of COVID a bit, and now with the Delta variant, things starting to spike. But as things looked really good in June into July, we had a certain number of people taking vacations and police fire and that type of stuff. So uh, getting back to more normal levels, nothing out of line there. On the fourth page, we did have a, a hearing here with an arbitrator. Um, on the one grievance that we've got outstanding, uh, briefs were due on that um, by August 31st, September 1st, somewhere right in that time frame. So both sides have filed. So uh, just waiting on the arbitrator at this point to respond um, to that particular grievance. Um, going to the fifth page of the report, you can see boat taxes um, this year, uh, new fiscal year rolling over. Again, we've bumped up our estimate a little bit just based on the increase in uh, registrations on the boat world that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, so early on uh, in, in the process here, the lion's share of that money comes in post January 1 as people are registering boats for next year. So, so not a whole lot to read into it there. And again, we already spoke a little bit about um, fire and EMS. So our ambulance billing numbers are tracked for you there. And, um, and you can see, you can see the number and actually as we always do when we cut it off, those August numbers are not probably fully complete at this point by the time we've gone to press for the September. So I would expect um, the billable numbers to be going up and more accurately um, reflect the number of calls that we had. So I'm happy to stop there and take any questions the council may have on financial and operational trends. Uh, Scott, I'm, I'm wondering if perhaps at, whether it's our next meeting or October meeting, it, um, we can do a little deeper dive into the EMS billing report. I doubt, I just wanna, we, we, we look at it every month and um, I, I'm just trying, and, and my goal here is to get a better sense of, of the cost run the ambulance and the revenue that we've actually been able to collect over time. Um, so just, just wondering if we do just a little deeper dive on those numbers from last fiscal year, if possible. Yeah, so maybe I'll just give you some of the trends that we've seen and, and what we believe will be the end result because billing out for ambulance in a lot of cases is either going through a federal governmental program, it's going through private insurance, um, or is for people who don't have insurance. And, and the collection rate and the speed at which you're collecting are different for all of those. Um, so sometimes you'll bill out something and if you, you, know, you pick out your bill in January, we know that it's most part 90 to 120 days is when you're seeing the lion's share of the money coming in for something that happened four months earlier. So, and then there's always that trickle effect, but we can certainly put some trends on the calls um, 
you know, we've got a good sense as to what our um, insurance pay base is, if you will. So we've got several years under our belt. We know how much is Medicare. We know how much is Medicaid on average. We know how much is private pay. We know what percentage of our folks don't have insurance that utilize the ambulance. So we can give you that sense. We've got a couple of years of history that know at the end of our collection cycle, we're pretty much going to collect about 70% of the net billing. Um, and then beyond there, COVID did turn into, um, you know, quite a drop in calls originally, you know, over a year ago at this time, you could just see the numbers drop significantly as people weren't going and stuff. So but we'll put together some trends and analysis, but it's one of those always thing, one of those things that's always got a significant lag to it. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm saying, I don't, I don't know if it's ne necessarily has to happen in September. Maybe we can go into October as well, but I, I would just like to get a continue to be aware of the data of, of the cost to run the ambulances and really what we're collecting to offset that, Absolutely. that cost and, and be very helpful. Any other questions on finan financial and operational trends? Seeing none, we are going to move along to item number 21 under new business. I intend to recuse myself and leave the room. I'll turn it over to the mayor pro tem. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as he mentioned, we are on 21A um, to refer the review of the proposed lease with EJM Holdings LLC to a public hearing on September 27th, 2021, during the regular city council meeting. The leasee agrees to use the premises only for providing parking spaces for registered and state inspected passenger cars and other automotive vehicles in connection with the residential units to be created in the Colonial Theater. During the first five years of the lease, the leasee shall pay rent in the sum of $27 per month per parking space, which total amount shall be due and pay in full in the start of the lease. For the second five years of the lease period, the leasee shall pay the sum of $28.50 per month per parking space. For the third five years of the lease period, the leasee shall pay $30 per month per parking space and shall at the start of the period, again, pay all rents in advance. For the fourth five years of the lease period, the leasee shall pay $31.50 per month per parking space and shall at the start of that period, again, pay all rents in advance. Therefore, beginning in the year 21, the lease period, the rent shall increase by 10% every five years. Total rent shall continue to be paid in the full for each five year period. Mr. Myers, do you have any other background that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'll just try to catch, uh, touch upon a couple of, uh, of main points here, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so this, this evolved and I think Councillor Hamill can certainly chime in and, and I'm gonna again, I'm gonna try to keep it at a high level, but he can certainly chime in as part of the working group with the Colonial. You know, if you recall a number of years back um, when we did not get the new market tax credits um, and there was concern about other funding stacks going in, that there was a strong likelihood that the residential component of, of this project was going to be mothballed and what was able to be completed were the storefronts, the four storefronts that Bell, Bell Dump EDC is owning and operating and the, and the theater component, if you will, including the canal street spaces that were utilized. Um, in discussions with various entities, and I wasn't necessarily privy in, in, in to, to these meetings, um, discussions evolved with, with Rusty and Jody McClear about coming in as investors in the project and creating the residential units up there. And in those conversations, um, again, I'm assuming the, the subject of parking and, and if you will, guaranteed or specific parking for folks who would be living in the downtown units um, was brought up. And I can recall Mayor Wrangler saying several times at public meetings that the city was going to be voting um, on a lease agreement to provide parking spaces for the units. At that time, uh, there was discussion as to whether there was going to be nine or 10 units in the project. It ended up being nine and then two units per space was the discussion. Um, or, or, the, or the request. And, and the city, I think, had a, uh, I'll refer to it as a gentleman's agreement that yes, we would work to provide parking. And then in those discussions, it's, you've got folks who are living in residences down there and sometimes just the day-to-day -day 
activities of a resident, they're carrying more in and out more, you know, could be groceries, could be a, a you know, a shopping trip somewhere else, could be dry cleaning, could be whatever. And those, those places need to be in a, in a relatively close proximity um, to, to where the, where the colonial is for ease of people and also desirability for people to want to buy those units and, and live downtown with not, you know, in inclement weather and late at night, knowing that they possibly need to walk four, five, six blocks obviously is not an ideal selling point if that's where your, your parking was identified. So um, it was working with um, local parking lots that we have. Uh, and again, if you think of parking and where the priority is and where you want turnover, your prime, your prime parking space in most downtowns is right in the heart of the downtown. And that's where you have your shortest short-term parking. And then the further you go away from the center, it's almost like stadium seating. You have longer term parking or, or less expensive parking, if you will. Um, the thinking with the groups talking here, um, and, and again, I wasn't at all those meetings, was that in order for the residential components to be successful, there had to be a reasonable proximity of parking. And in this case, that would fall to the two hour parking spaces because our all day parking tends to be further on the periphery around the downtown area. Um, so we tried to identify a couple of spots in the downtown Main Street lot or, or eight spots in the Main Street lot, uh, do 10 spots over here. Uh, we tried to look at the at the businesses that were in play. Um, you know, we didn't take the first three or four spaces, or I guess there's one handicapped space in the, in the municipal lot here by the curb cut across from Canal Street. Those first four spaces were left open and 10 spaces were identified um, in that particular area and eight spaces kind of wrapped around the corner in the municipal lot. Again, trying to give different pockets of parking uh, make them available to support different businesses. So we knew, for instance, Wayfarer had a back entrance that a lot of people use. We didn't want to tie up all the parking spaces outside of that business that utilized it. So there definitely was a balance going into it, um, approach of, of how to identify these spots. Um, it was also determined that the city did not have a fully defined paid parking program in the downtown and no councilor bounds left led the initiative on that and we don't have kiosks we don't have monthly permits so we we developed a price structure and knowing that we weren't in the parking collection business so to speak it was structured so that in this particular case the rent for the the the, the rental for the spaces for all of the spaces would be paid in advance for a five-year block generating about twenty nine thousand dollars a little over twenty nine thousand dollars payable up front as a condition for entering into the lease. And then every five years, assuming the entity was looking to um, continue with those parking spaces, again, it would be payable and full for that time frame. So that was the thought process to it, um, supporting significant investment um, to continue to make the Colonial Project successful, um, trying to identify spaces. Um, you know, there still are a lot of two hour spaces all the way along the post office wall right opposite Canal Street. Canal Street itself is designated all two hour parking. So again, we're encouraging the turnover. Um, the spaces that we've identified in the Main Street lot, again, are up four from Canal Street. So they're on the side of the Penny Patu building and in front of the, the drive through, if you will, not directly in a storefront. Uh, the other thing, while it may seem minor in, in nature a little bit, having a grass area to be able to put a, a metal post into the ground to be able to identify came into play versus having metal posts in the middle of the parking lot, which provides some challenges, especially in winter maintenance time when plows are going through at high speeds and, you know, and all of a sudden our, our signs get dinged or, or whatever and stuff. So that was the thought process. It certainly was um, not to, not to harm any business and the thought of having an additional 18 plus residents live in the downtown, we thought it was a great investment that actually is supporting those businesses on top of the investment that the city and Belknap EDC made. So I don't know if Councillor Hamill, you were a little closer on some of those, but I think that's the, the general background, but. Um, well, I think you pretty much covered it all, you know, pretty good, uh, Scott. Uh, the, as you said, uh, those two stories were in limbo for quite a long time. Uh, because, you know, trying to get the new market tax credits uh, as we went on with the project and the new markets, uh, we found out that they did not support residential construction, only commercial. So those built that uh, two floors would not have been done with the new market tax credit. So that kind of left it, like you said, uh, it would be gutted and left gutted. And that's the way it would be until we found somebody or somebody had some interest or whatever. Um, 
luckily Rusty came along and uh, agreed to do that uh, and spent a significant amount of money in there, you know, and, and there's other developers that did the same thing downtown, um, you know, but also, uh, you know, as you're, you were discussing about the pricing and all that for, the, for those spaces, those are also going to be accessed for tax property tax basis, I believe at $1,000 a space. Yes, by state law, whenever you enter into a lease for property, you have to lease the fair market value of that in addition. So they would be paying property tax on that square footage in addition to the lease rental. So that's $1,000 a year for that. Um, so, uh, you know, we also as a council voted to buy the, the property at St. Joe's Church, which also brings in another 84 spaces there, which is a good thing. And, you know, you can consider it overflow parking or not. Uh, but I, I, I think the addition of all those condo units, the 18, 20 people that are gonna be living there using the services, even if they park in those spaces, they're gonna to go to Thrillium, they're gonna to go to the bakery, they're gonna to go to Wayfair. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's people who are gonna use the services downtown a lot. You know, whether we can find better spaces, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't part of that negotiation, but, uh, I can't, you know, it, it would be hard to see that Rusty would invest that kind of money and, and do a really great job on high-end condo units if he didn't, wasn't going to provide parking uh, for the people who are going to buy it. So, like I said, you know, I don't know if we could <clears throat> find 10 or more two-hour parking. Maybe we could use part of the reverse parking along that goes towards uh, Canal Street. We could probably but those two hour parking to make up for some of this. Yes, I mean, it certainly could, it certainly could adjust to replace two hour parking spaces elsewhere. Yeah, so I, I think we could find some in that area. Councilor Lippman. Yeah, no, I, I just wanna to add to what Bob's saying. I think fundamentally the Colonial Project might not have come off without, um, and that would have been a lot worse, yeah. a lot worse off than, than we are. I, I think in terms of looking at some other options for, you know, could you move a few of the spaces down on the same side there? And and uh, it's like, I see what the point about like the Trillium and the ones that are at the top of Canal Street, that those are kind of some of the ones that they might use. But, you know, I, I hear people saying that, you know, heard a couple of the comments, you know, I'd like to do this or I'd like to do that. Um, and, you know, the government's not treating people fairly. The bottom line is we were left, city was left with a, albatross in the middle of downtown that could have further depreciated um, property values and your businesses and we didn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here we're we're certainly as a council interested in improving the parking situation We've, we made that investment across the street we're going to be talking later about the investment we're looking to make in the parking garage you know um it uh i i appreciate People don't want necessarily what's in this proposal exactly, but you know, I think we also have some obligations to you know what we were able to accomplish here, and I think we'll we'll try to give. I think we should move this forward to a public hearing. We can take input on it. Uh, certainly not a closed mind in terms of what a solution might be, but you know. I think, you know, moving them out to the hinterlands is not consistent with what was um, able to put this deal together for the city. And, and it's for the city at large because it's improving the tax base of, of everybody at lowering property taxes throughout the community. It's providing the, the catalyst um, to make the downtown strong. So I appreciate the concerns, but I think, you know, if you look at it in isolation, like some of the people who testified tonight, I, I think you're missing part of the picture. Okay, thank you, Councilor Lippman. Councilman Susie, and then Councilor Cheney. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Roberto. Um, I had a couple of different things. Number one, I I would like to see us look at maybe other spots. Okay, I, what Mr. Sawyer said is really true. Okay, and I, I worry about that. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to support all the businesses. I think it's fantastic what we've done to Colonial. I mean, awesome. But maybe we can move back one row. Okay. I, I know what you're saying, Scott, about, you know, having put in post there for the, maybe there's some other way we can do it. But I can see us move, maybe move back one row. And the other question I have is that when I, I just did some quick calculations, I'm looking at 
each space for the year is roughly three hundred and twenty four dollars a year. Minus, now, minus the taxes, Bob. No, on top of the taxes. Yeah. On yeah. top of the taxes. And taxes are a thousand dollars. So that's what twenty something dollars. Okay. Hold on a second, Bob, please. Okay. And you know, twenty seven dollars a month times twelve is what I'm looking at each space. Plus the, and plus Bob, the when we're talking about the parking garage, we're talking about thirty five or forty thousand dollars a space. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, not for the parking garage. That oh, this one, that would be for a new one. A new one, okay. But even for an, a refurbished parking garage, three hundred twenty-four dollars a year for a space plus twenty dollars for the taxes, pretty darn cheap, okay. And I, I have a question over that because even if we're uh, at some point in time, maybe we're going to be faced with having to put meters or kiosk or something like that, that's still pretty. I question the, the cost here, okay, or what we're charging for a lease value for, for one of the spaces, especially their prime spaces within the downtown area. And, and that's a valid question. And I think, again, some of the, the discussions that came out in the gentleman's agreement were there was going to be a discounted rate because the flip side to it is if the, if the residential component of the colonial was mothballed, you don't have maybe a million and a half or $2 million in value coming online once it's fully complete. And that $2 million in value at a, roughly a $20 per thousand valuation is going to generate $40,000 in property tax every year. So maybe you're not getting it because you're supporting that investment in your monthly parking rate, but you're gaining it somewhere else significantly in the terms of the value that got onto that second and third floor for the residential component. It's unique. It's a unique arrangement. And I wasn't part of any of the discussions on, on, on the, the contract before us, but conceptually getting the colonial done was an amazing thing given all the obstacles that we got, uh, had to navigate through and getting the residential piece to be what it is to balance out the, the, the development in the downtown in terms of the different demographic mix in there. Uh, you know, I think we can be sensitive to what the merchants have have brought forward potentially by making some adjustments to the spaces here. But I think to, to rethink the whole thing is, is, you know, basically not the right approach to the commitment that was made to the developers and, and the investments they've already made in it. So I think, you know, can we tweak this? Yes. Can we like withdraw what we basically um, agreed to, to start all over again, I think would be, um, a bad form for the city in terms of working with developers. No, I'd like to see us tweak it, Henry. Okay. I just don't want to. But you, were quite, you were questioning also the, the, the cost. The I'm looking at the, the cost thing because. But, that's, but that, I think, as the manager said, it's part of a. You have to look at the whole picture, not just the parking space. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the whole picture because, as Mr. Sawyer said, and the other merchants downtown, Mr. Commodentry coming on. Yeah, you yeah, know I, what? I, 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 hear, I hear you. If, well, if I may you. finish. Okay. I, I hear you, but I think you're missing a big piece. No, I'm not missing this point because I think the Colonial Theater is a tremendous magnet to bring all kinds of good stuff to the area. Not, if we can move back one row here and there and keep everybody happy, I think we'd be pretty happy. I think the, the end of this says we go to another public hearing. Am I correct? Absolutely. I think that's, that's the that's, sole purpose of this is to generate another public, public hearing, hearing where the okay. public will have a right to speak. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Susie. Councilor Cheney. I uh, I also have a little bit of concern about the pricing, not in the short term, but over the long term, and the rather minimal amount of increase uh, over a twenty or thirty year period. Uh, but the other concern I have is that we we take the time to sit down with some of these folks and at least hear them out uh, before we have a public hearing. I'd like the manager and some members of the of the council to meet with Mr. Sawyer and others, because I'm sure there are others mm -hmm. who would like an opportunity to express their concerns or their questions. There's got to be other places we can put it. I would suggest to the manager that I wouldn't put any posts up in the back row, but we, we paint uh, handicapped spots every year, and I'm sure we could paint uh, uh, reserve parking spots, but that's for another day. I just would ask that this council uh, 
postpone this long enough, whether we extend it or, or set the public hearing out into October to give us time to meet with Mr. Sawyer and others to discuss options. Okay, Councilor Cheney, is that That's motion? a motion? Motion. Okay. Seconded. All right. Now, uh, I'd like to discuss the motion. Okay, certainly, Council Lemons. So I think we can do both things. I think we should not drag this out um, in terms of the public hearing. I think we can have the public hearing because then we'll have a, a better picture when we sit down with folks. I think I have no disagreement with what you're suggesting, Bruce, in terms of um, meeting with the folks downtown. But I think when we meet with them, we'd be much better positioned to hear what the public at large has had to say before we... we uh, uh, and, and I would submit to you, Henry, that postponing it into October is not dragging it out. It's putting it off one meeting, perhaps two. The fact is that the, the citizens may or may not come in uh, to a public hearing to discuss this, but the people who are directly affected by it uh, or feel they're directly affected by it ought to have a chance to sit with us before that uh, public hearing okay. so that we can include that in the discussion. Okay. Councilor Cheney, are you, do you want to set a specific date uh, as part of your motion? The 11th is Columbus Day, Cheryl, so we're looking at the 12th, that week. Yes. Yeah. Going October 12th to October 25th. I, I, I set October 12th. Tuesday, October 12th. So if I could, Mayor Pro, Pro Tem, it's probably appropriate that you still read the three motions and when you get to the third one, just substitute the date if that's the will of the council till the October 12th. So at least those three motions, they are read into the All record. Right. Just a second, Council Felt. Yeah, um, I've spoke to some of the merchants downtown, some of the buildings owners. Um, I went through this back when we were talking about um, <clears throat> paid parking downtown. Um, at that time, we were talking $50 a space a per month per space um, to lease the spaces and now we're at about half that we're gonna have to plow these spaces sand these spaces completely maintain them pave them when they need to be paved again line them whenever they need to be lined um, so i have a problem with the pricing as well um, i also have a problem with the locations you know you mentioned behind uh, the coffee shop downtown those spaces are full all the time for him and they're in and out and in and out. They shouldn't have to walk a long distance just because of condos leasing those spaces. I also have a problem with the fact that all this was done and evidently none of the merchants or building owners downtown were even contacted about it. I talked to Mark Kondamatraki with the money he spent on his building. Why can't he lease another 10, 20 spaces? And if we get into that, honestly, I where think are we going to be? Thinking that's taken the downtown into a bad position. Honestly, I, I got to say, for people who are new to the council, relatively, you're missing the point big time. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm not missing the point. I'm looking out for my constituents and no, the people. No, that... you're not. You're you're basically kowtowing to um, a perspective. Okay, without considering the larger picture. Honestly, okay. Okay. although you say. All right, are you? I'm done. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk, do you have Councilor Cheney's motion when we get to that point? I will. You will? will. Okay, all right. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to say to the council, there are other members in the audience that the uh, this will affect as far as the downtown is concerned. So I think Councilor Cheney, your uh, comments were well taken and I'm sure that we can get others to participate in what you would propose. Okay. There are three motions and I'd like to move forward, please. The first motion is I move to waive the reading of the proposed lease of EJM Holdings LLC to its entirety and to read by title only. So I move that. Okay. And as a counselor, I can move that. Is there any discussion? Yes. I have a problem with moving this reading. We want the public to know what's going on. I think it needs to be read so the public can hear what's going on. Sorry. Right. Oh, there's a motion on the There's a motion on the tape. Okay. Madam Clerk, can you read the motion, please? You oh, no, we have the motion. I'm sorry. Okay. Those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Okay. All opposed? 
Okay, it's four to one that passes. All right, second is I move the first reading of the proposed lease with EJM Holdings LLC. Okay, Councilor Cheney, Council Lipman, seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. Okay, so we have four to one, Madam, Madam Clerk. Okay, the third reading is I move to schedule a second reading and a public hearing regarding the proposed lease with EJM Holdings LLC to October 25th, nope, 12th, October 12th, 2021, during the regular city council meeting to gather the public's input. Do I have a motion? I, I make that motion. Councilor Cheney, Councilor Susi seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Cheryl, I did vote. All right. Okay. And Scott, is this going to be available on the city website? It is right now. Whenever we post our agenda, the entire background information packet that you all receive is all available for everybody. It's got the maps of the designated parking spaces. It's got a copy of the lease agreement. Uh, if anybody needs help finding it, please contact the city clerk's office and they can send you a link. And if they need a copy, they can come here and get it. That line's available too if someone wants it in the audience. Okay. Uh, I'm moving to item 21B. The uh, topic is the Red Anchor Wellness Health Expo requests to waive fees associated with the event. The request. First is, question. Yes. I think we can have the mayor come back now. I'm not sure yeah, where he is. Let me dig on that. <laughs> <laughs> Because he only recused himself from that. Okay. Can I move? Yeah. Okay. I guess. All right. A request has been made to waive the fees of the Red Angel Wellness Health Expo to be held at Opeachy Park on September 25th, 2021. The event was approved by the Parks and Recreation Committee at their August 16th, 2021 meeting and approved by a special events review committee at their September 1st, 2021 meeting, a copy of the organizer ap application and the map of the event is attached. Mr. Myers, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, this is a first time event from a local business owner who's looking to incorporate a lot of uh, like-minded wellness businesses. And it went through the Parks Commission approval and you've got the map in the background and um, sounds like a great family uh, event, uh, a new event coming here in Laconia. Okay. Yes, discussion, um, please. Yeah, as, as always, Scott, uh, Parks and Recs will go out and map the uh, irrigation system there so no pins are driven through the pipes. Absolutely. Okay. And then and one other question. Sure. They're, go ahead, Councilor Susan. They're responsible for like all trash and cleanup. I, I'm not sure this is, I think this is more of an information booth type of thing as opposed to that type of stuff. But I mean, Parks Commission usually has a plan in place for dealing with that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I'll make a motion. Um, I'm sorry, the mayor has returned. <laughs> All right. Go, go ahead, Council Susan. I move that we approve the request to waive the fees associated with the Red Anchor Wellness Health Expo to be held at Opeachy Park on September 25th, 2021. Okay. Seconded by Councilor Hamill. Is there any other further discussion? Um, we will take up a take take a vote. And all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Mm -hmm. Councilor Cheney voting? I'm not. This is this okay. Is Councilor email. Cheney was absent, so the, the the vote is for actually five. Is there anyone opposed? Okay. Mr. Mayor, no thank you. I'm happy to sit there. You want to keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so we're on item 21C, is that correct? Yes, sir. Which is a 
Temporary Traffic Order 2021-11 for the Laconia Bike Timberfest and request to waive fees associated with the event. Uh, a request has been made to Laconia to hold Laconia Bike Timberfest on September 17th and 19th, 2021 from the hours of 5 p.m. Friday, September 17th to 5 p.m. Sunday, September 19th. Section 161-4 of the city's code states in part that outdoor sound shall not operate past the hour of 9 p.m. Sunday to Thursday and 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday with the exception of Motorcycle Week. Organizers of the event are requesting that the time set forth as shown above be extended to allow bands to play until 11 p.m. on 9-17 and 9-18. The city special events review committee approved this event at their meeting on July 7th. Copy of the committee's notice of action and a map of the event are provided for additional information. This report was submitted by Scott Myers, our city manager. Be looking for a motion right now to move to approve temporary traffic order 2021-11. So made by Councilor Felch, seconded by Councilor Cheney. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, I'd ask all those in favor to please indicate by raising your hands. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Item number 21D, which is temporary traffic order 2021-12, Weir's Tober Fest. Uh, a request has been made to hold Weir's Tober Fest, that's a mouthful, on October 1st through the 3rd, 2021, for the hours of 5 p.m. Friday, October 1st, to 5 p.m. Sunday, October 3rd. Organizers requesting to use the city's sidewalk area between Tower Street and Foster Avenue as shown on the attached map of the event and also to request that the adjacent parking spaces in that area be reserved for that event. There'll be no patrons allowed in the reserved parking spaces. As you can see, this request is being made to avoid the high cost of providing Jersey barriers between the parking spaces and Lakeside Avenue. The organizer, who I believe is here with us tonight, will provide a fence as a barricade between the sidewalk and the curb adjacent to the parking spaces. The parking spaces will be reserved for the use of cones and or barricades. Once again, the special events review committee approved this request at their September 1st, 2021 meeting. Since paid parking on Lakeside Avenue will still be in effect during this event, the organizer of this event, Anthony Santagate, would be happy to discuss payment to the city for the revenue that would be lost for those spaces during the event. So right now I'll be looking for a motion to approve the temporary traffic order 2021-12 Weir's Tober Fest and allow alcohol consumption on city sidewalks as designated. So made by Councillor Haynes, seconded by Councillor Belch. Is there any further discussion on this before us? Councillor Litmus. Yes. Um, you had mentioned that uh, there was an offer to pick up the the parking costs, do we have that? And can we make that part of the motion? Uh, sure. Councilor Felch. I would actually like to waive that. There'll be plenty of parking in the weirs. So I don't think it's gonna affect, it's gonna help business in the weirs. So I'd like to waive those fees. That's a motion I second. Is you right, that time of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be uh, uh, that would be an amendment offered to the right. motion that's on the table right now. Well, it's been a first by Councilor Felch, a second by Councilor Hamill. Um, all those in favor of the amendment right now that's on the table, indicate by raising your hand. Six votes in the affirmative. For, so the amendment passes. We're still in the discussion of the underlying motion. Any further questions or discussion on this? All those in favor of the motion as amended, please indicate by raising your hands. Six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. <laughs> Anthony, where do you come up with these names? <laughs> <clears throat> so item number 21E, this is a temporary traffic order 2021-13, the Wicked Weirs. Uh, a request has been made to hold Wicked Weirs on October 29th to the 31st, 2021, from the hours of 5 p.m. Friday, October 29th to Sunday, October 31st. Does that line up correctly? Because the dates here are wrong. Yes, it does. Okay, good. Once again, the organizer of this event 
was requesting to use the city sidewalk area between Tower Street and Foster Avenue as shown on the attached map of the event, and also to request that the adjacent parking spaces in the area be reserved for the event. There will be no patrons allowed in the reserved parking. This request is being made to avoid the high cost again of providing the Jersey barriers. The Special Events Review Committee approved this request at their September 1st, 2021 meeting. Paid parking on Lakeside Avenue will no longer be in effect during this event. So I'll be looking for a motion to approve TTO 2021-13. So made by Councilor Fouch, seconded by Councilor Hamels. Is there any further discussion on the, this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hands. That's six votes in the affirmative, and that motion passes. <laughs> Next up on our agenda 21F, which is temporary traffic order 2021 14 for the runaway pumpkin event. Anthony did not name this, it's not nearly as creative. <laughs> 2021 runaway pumpkin, a 5K run, 5K, 10K run, walk. Kids fun run will take place on October 16th, 2021. All races will start and finish at Smith Track and Opeachy. Proceeds from the event will benefit the Wild Trail. This event is usually done in conjunction with Pumpkin Festival, the Pumpkin Festival, but due to its cancellation this year, a run will go on as a separate event. Special Events Review Committee approved this event at their August 4th, 2021 meeting. So we'll be looking for a motion to approve TTO 2021-14. Approve. So moved by Councillor Felch, second by Councillor Haynes. Is there any further discussion on this this evening? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hands. Six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. Item number 21G, which is the acceptance of funds from the Laconia Life Saving Fund on June 14th, 2021. Public hearing was held regarding a resolution for anticipated grants. Included in this public hearing was the anticipation of the fire department receiving $15,000 from the Laconia Life Saving Fund to send one firefighter to paramedic school. The money has now become available and Chief Biotti is looking for the council to approve, to accept and expend the money. So we'll be looking for a motion right now to approve the acceptance of $15,000 from the Laconia Life Saving Fund to send one firefighter to paramedic school. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Lippman. Any further discussion? One question I have, what is the life, Laconia Life Saving Fund, Scott? It's a private organization um, that raises funds. I, I believe this particular one is the um, tied into the Macris Memorial Ride that happens during Motorcycle Week, and that used to be done for some of the water rescue activities. And since the city has disbanded that, they they broadened it just to the life saving fund. Terrific, thank you. So, all those, if there's no further questions or comments, all those in favor of the motion, indicate by raising your hands. Six votes in the affirmative, and that motion passes. Thank you. Under item 22, which is our unfinished unfinished business. It's the first reading of ordinance 2021-235-22.7 to amend city code chapter 235 zoning to update section 22.7, authority to assess impact fees, amending the formula to collect only a portion of the established fee instead of the full amount. Uh, Scott, could you lead us through just for, uh, once again from the 10,000 foot level here? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the city uh, worked with um, a consultant back in the 2009-2010 timeframe um, to come up with um, impact fees to have new construction coming online, help pay the way for future growth or additions needed by the city. And depending on if it was residential or business, there were various um, contributions lined up to be made towards schools, police, fire, recreation, roads, and library. Uh, at the time when they worked with the consultant, um, there had been some challenges to some municipalities um, price tag of the impact fees, if you will, and the courts are determined they need to be made with sound judgment and be reasonable and be applied. Um, so we've had no challenges with these. Um, if you think back to where the economy was in the 2010-2011 timeframe, just coming out of a very bad 
uh, economic downturn. Uh, the city council took the rec recommendation of the planning board to adopt impact fees, but only chose to implement them at a 25% level. So that's where we've been all the way along since 2011 till today. So uh, it was a request made of this council to have the planning board review where we are and come back with a recommendation. Their recommendation um, to the council was to increase it from what was a level of 25% based on 2011 dollars to bring it up to a 50% level today. And then increase it annually um, by the rate of 10% uh, until you hit the 100% level. I know when the council discussed this before it was tabled, um, I believe there was general support to do the increase, but not necessarily do the automatic 10% every year. After that, it certainly could be placed on a tickler file and come on to an agenda item to you every year to review and see if you wanted to do that. So um, that's the basis of impact fees and a little bit of its history, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Lippman. I'd like to make a motion to um, adopt the 50% and then to um, follow what the manager just suggested, where we seem to have a consensus last month, which is to review it thereafter annually as we try to balance. Um, yeah. We need to remove this from the table. Very good. I'll make the motion to remove it from the table. Then. <laughs> is there a second? second? All those in favor? Uh, so. Well, motion made, seconded by Councilor Felch. You. Any discussion? All those, all those in favor of removing it? Moving. Six votes in the affirmative. It's off the table. So then I'd like to make another motion <laughs> um, to adopt the recommendation of, of moving to 50%, because when you consider inflation and everything, it's probably about where we started from. And then to evaluate it year by year to make sure we're balancing collecting the fee against you know trying to keep housing stock affordable in the community i'll second that you have to wait for reading first yes so okay so the, the, is first of all the first motion is uh been removed from the table second second motion is going to move to waive the reading of this ordinance in its entirety to read by title only. I'd prefer to read the entire ordinance myself. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> Go for right. it, right? All right, okay. Is there, a motion for, yeah, is there a motion to read by title only? Councilor Chini, there is. I have seconded by Councilor Haynes. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, the six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Okay. All right, so. I'm going to run to what Henry said. Henry's motion. So Henry's motion, Councilor Lippman's motion, he's moved, he wants a motion to move a first reading of ordinance 2021-235-22.7, amending the adopted impact fee schedule to increase the amount collected to 50% on April 1st, 2022. Period. Correct. And, and, and or semicolon and to evaluate Yearly, yearly. yearly any future increases and to evaluate yearly any future any future increase okay is that clear is there enough clarity there oh. we would do that as part of the budget process sure is there a second for that there is. seconded by councillor chini is there any further discussion uh, on this and once again, just for just for the record and for those maybe tuning in, and the impact fee offsets what, uh, Scott? It, it's, it was basically set up to help um, to help the, the value of the new development coming in line with new residents. Obviously, creates more demand for everything from plowing services to police cruisers to, in some cases, school classrooms. So it was really meant to have new development pay a share of the added cost for additional capital needs. And again, on the on the um, on the business side, it was only applied to police and fire and roads. On the residential side, it further was impacted with schools, recreation, and library. Again, trying to differentiate between what the real need of a business is versus what the needs of the residential component is, and how you justify assessing these fees. So your non-residential development is charged on a per uh, square foot basis. Yes. But they are not non-residential developments. Are not do not pay an impact fee associated with public schools, recreation, and the library. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And then, if you do adopt the motion that Council Lipman put forward, 
uh, we will be adjusting the language and the ordinance to reflect that. And that's what will be referred to the public okay. hearing at this point. So everybody will know what the actual language is that they should be commenting on. Okay, terrific. So uh, the motion, there's a motion on the table. Then a second. Uh, is there any further discussion on the issue on the motion? Seeing none, I'd ask all those in favor of the motion indicate by raising your hand, six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Okay. So now we are, I'm looking for a motion to schedule a public hearing on September 27, 2021, during the regular council meeting to gather public input prior to any action being taken. So made by Councillor Haynes, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of moving this to a public hearing, please indicate six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. How about we do 22C right now, and then we'll go back to the final item will be 22B, if that's okay. That's fine. All right. So under 22C, which is the proposed ballot question for a charter amendment. Um, so what we discussed earlier as far as um, proposed ballot question for the charter amendment because of the, the delay in um, the census data as a result of COVID-19. Um, and this would be something that would be a permanent aspect of the charter, which you're starting to learn now. Um, so right now, um, I'll be looking for a motion to waive a reading of this resolution in its entirety and to read by title only. So made by Councilor Cheney, seconded by Councilor Felch. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, I'd ask all those in favor to raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six in the affirmative, that motion passes. Second motion, we'll be looking for a motion to approve language to Article One of the City Charter as presented in Resolution 2021-17 and to add the question to the ballot for the municipal election to be held on November 2nd, 2021. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Cheney, is there any further discussion? Councillor Hamill. Okay, so it says they're going to add this on a municipal ballot for a second. So is there time to do that, Scott? Yes, because the, the question, if you recall from our special meeting, we, we forwarded the language down to the Attorney General's office, the Secretary of State's office, and Department of Revenue Administration. Those are the three state agencies that need to review this. And um, I, I, I did speak personally with um, Deputy Secretary of State Dave Scanlon and, and share with him our little bit of a time crunch. And the fact they've already reviewed a very similar question, charters aren't identical, but they've already in, in, in principle reviewed questions for Dover and Keene who are also doing the same thing right now in order to be able to get it um, handled two thirds with the vote of the council. So we've asked that they, if they are able to speed up their 30 day window, which would technically begin if you move this to a public hearing tonight, I'm sorry, you had the public hearing tonight. If you move this to the ballot tonight, this would technically start their 30 day window. We've got the language we're proposing to them several weeks ago in hopes that we can speed it up. We really need an answer by, um, well, end of September, 1st of October at the latest. And then we have to get our ballots um, finalized, get them to the printer, get a proof back, and then they have to be printed and get here for us in time to have absentee ballots. So the answer is yes, this question, if everything lines up, can move forward and be ready to go. What wouldn't be ready to go is the census data because that's not coming out until September 30th. Right. So, so the, the question on the ballot would, would be, whether or not to allow the city council right. to make changes to the district. 
in, a, in, in after so a after a duly advertised okay. public hearing and with a two thirds majority vote in the council Lipman's point is we're going to start working on this aggressively so hopefully have a very good sense of what the proposals are with public right. input along the way. So they'll see what they would otherwise vote on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just to, yes, so, so the actual setting of the boundaries goes to government operations. I know I'm getting ahead of myself. The government just, operations would be the committee we work on it with, and then it comes to the full council for a vote. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Mayor. And it's just the balancing of the population in each ward. Right. right. So right, right now we know the raw numbers. We know that wards one and six, probably, I don't have the numbers in front of me, each have 300, let me back up, 2,800 and something is the perfect number if we divided our population into all six wards. Wards one and six are somewhere around 300 or 400 above that number and need to shift some of their population. Ward three is about 400 under that number and needs to gain some population. And then wards four and five are off by about 2%, which if we're going through and changing the boundaries, it would make sense because the goal is to um, get as close to equal ward representation as possible, but you also need to use the census tracts and the small little subsections they have, and it should use natural barriers or streets as division. It shouldn't look like a jigsaw puzzle at the end of the day where you're you're, you're cutting and carving all over the place. So you've, you've got some ground rules in the big sense, uh, but the goal is to get to as equal population in all six wards. And we know definitely wards one and, and six need to yield some population and most specifically to ward three. The only, the only good child in the room is ward two. They seem to be pretty, pretty much spot on. <laughs> we'll pick up a little bit off the ward six side. <laughs> okay, thanks Scott. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have motion, motions on the table. All those in favor of the motion on the table, please indicate by raising six zero. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can I just make one comment? Please do. So, in the ordinary course, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Scott, we would have put together a proposal that specifically would have went on the ballot, which would have been voted up or down. Yes. So what we're doing here is saying, effectively, <laughs> allowing the council to put a proposal which can be voted up or down on November 2nd. It's allowing the council the authority. And yes, if our hope is to have it out there and fully vetted as we so, would during the So if the we don't process. listen, we're no, no worse shape than we otherwise would. If the issue is the timing of getting a ballot prepared. We can't meet it. <laughs> but but if, if this question you would now just move to the municipal ballot fails then we will then you then the, the authority for the council to do that with a two-thirds vote does not exist then at that point and it means we will need to hold a special election most likely in january and we'll also which is what we're trying to avoid we'll also mess up what the state parties are trying to accomplish again well. part of this is trying to work with the legislative redistricting that's going on right now and they're already chomping at the bit looking for our breakdown of wards. So in our case right now, all of our ward representatives are elected at large. But if you recall back to 2000, after the 2010 census, one of the original proposals, I believe was to, I think it was ward four in Belmont, were going to be yes. grouped together. Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of us having our ward four number in place. If something like that were to happen going forward, not every community has all of their representatives elected at large. So some of the larger communities, they're elected by, you know, three wards out of 12 type of thing. And so that's why that's why it's important we have our work because if 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 a town is in between population and they don't warrant enough on their own, they've got to carve off a little piece of another community. And that's where a ward might come into play. Thank you. Moving on to item number 22B, uh, which will be the last item on our agenda tonight, which is the parking garage repair or deconstruct options. Um, this item was tabled on uh, the August 23rd, 2021 council meeting. So I guess the first thing we should do is take it off the table, right? So we're looking for a motion to take this item. So made by Councilor Phelps, seconded by Councilor Hamill. 
Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of taking it off the table, six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. So um, I think we can. Scott, would you like to walk us through this, um, please? I can. Um, so we've, uh, I think as was mentioned at the podium by one speaker tonight, we've probably been discussing this uh, in a minimum the last 10 years I've been here, probably maybe a little bit longer about what to do. Um, obviously, as, as, um, as things get delayed, um, challenges compound in some cases and the money compounds. So um, what we're looking at with some fixes early on um, have gone up in price as the structure is deteriorated and needed more. Um, is it was broken down into two components, if you will, several years back. One is just the nuts and bolts of the garage, the physical structure, and what is that going to cost versus new lighting, a new facade, adding exterior um, glass staircase for visibility and, and safety, having an elevator to meet to may, uh, today's needs and also the needs of the community and people coming to the colonial and those types of things. So um, it, it's morphed a little bit, but it's, it's stayed fairly um, fairly consistent over the time, except the price has been going up and we've been doing a lot more, what I'll refer to as Band-Aid repairs, but some of those Band-Aid repairs in any given year can be expensive Band-Aids. Um, right now we're at a point where, as you know, over the years we've closed the top deck, we've, um, we've had to close off specific parking spaces on the second deck um, that aren't safe and you see some of the metal plates up there, so we are certainly not 100% functional. We provided some um, estimates for you on new construction. I think it was alluded to earlier tonight. Construction of a parking space in a new garage is somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars, based on other New Hampshire and/or New England communities who have built something recently. So, if you were to build a three hundred space parking garage, you're looking in the ten to twelve million dollar um, range for that. Um, so, we've 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 put that out there. We've talked about deconstructing, as was mentioned earlier tonight. You know, the challenge there is the second deck or the first deck up, I guess, if you will, is actually the roof of the retail there. So if you were to dismantle, um, it's got to be a kind of a surgical dismantle because you can't be destroying the retail on the first level. And at the end of the day, you need to put a quality roof on there before um, we're done with the project. And then we still need to replace those parking spaces somewhere else. The city does not own any of the land on the parking structure. We have right to access it for repairs and maintenance, and we are fully responsible for the ramps all you know, up and down into both decks and, and everything else with it. So um, we are looking at a estimated number. We went out and uh, worked with um, uh, Du Bois and King, and I know Bob Durfee I see in the back has done a lot of work on this um, over the years for us and certainly could be a resource if there were any questions. Um, but we've we've taken the most recent updated number and put an escalator to it versus going out and just investing again. And we think it's probably a, a six to a six point million dollar project to do it properly, bringing up to today's standards for uh, design, operation, cleanliness, lighting, elevator, staircase, all that type of stuff. And the cost to deconstruct. Um, Uh, two million. Thank you, Wes. On the top of the second page of your background information, so about two million to deconstruct, and then we have no parking spaces. About six and a half, six point six is our estimate here, based on uh, the increase in materials and in labor over the last couple of years. Thank you, Scott. Councilor Susan. Scott, do you know if that uh, six point six or includes bringing up to ADA standards? Yes. Yes, we would, because we would have the elevators in there and that would do whatever <coughs> access points on all levels. Yes. Thank you. you know. Scott, at $6.6 .6 million, um, uh, how does that break out for space? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of your head. <laughs> no cheating. No cheating, huh? <laughs> Why don't you go on to another question while I find out how to use my phone and find the calculator on it. <laughs> Somebody's going to do it for me in the audience. So if we did 6.6 .6 and we've got 200 and 250 spaces. Yeah. Which I believe that would be a little bit less. Yeah, it'd be about 25. Yeah. 26.4, the finance director says, ding, ding, ding. So, so in the area of, you know, roughly... Yeah. You know, space. twelve to fifteen thousand dollars less expensive for space to rehabilitate. Yeah, reconstruct. Yeah. 
So that would be, if we were to deconstruct it, it'd be about $8,000 per space to deconstruct. Can I just ask about building. that number? No. Sure, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, have we adjusted the deconstruct number? That's that two million, and we've been dragging that one for a while. Yeah, and that's, that's my point. And that's, that's, and that's a wild card. I mean, to really go in and understand the nuance of how to take it apart. I mean, that's a that's a hand grenade range type number to it. Yeah. Um, and, and just to be fair on the parking spaces, I mean, this includes, you know, uh, the elevator and this in an exterior stairwell, which aren't, but that's all, that's an all built in price when we get to that 26,000 per, per space. That's, you know, very nice and, and very attractive spaces that people would like to use. They wouldn't be afraid to use them. Right. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilor Susie. Okay. And another question. And when it comes to, it says here, out to 22, 23, which is when you would think about design and construction, okay? Yeah, I mean, so we certainly, if you if we move this to a public hearing and you give the go ahead, we're gonna start the design, but realistically construction is, you know, 18 months out at the earliest. Right, probably so, 24 months, my, so my question comes down to, um, naturally we would be bonding this and today the bond rates are very, very low and mm -hmm. I'm really scared about what they're gonna be like in two or three, two years when you get to 2022, 2023. So if we have the commitment and going forward, we could go out with what we estimate to believe the needs of it and lock it in. You can't um, you can't go out and just arbitrage and borrow money and sit on for four years and not do your project. But right. if we're doing it within a reasonable time frame, and phase one is the design and engineer part of it, certainly we could lock, look to lock in that money. You know. The... <clears throat> okay. Thank you. In terms of the New Hampshire Bond Bank, I think in the. Municipal Association, the magazine was advertising a January um, uh, issuance that for 30 years, I think was at 1.6. Um, yeah, that's something that's exactly the reason why. But, but they, but they use a phrase in there called the- Indicative rate. <laughs> the true, true cost of money is the phrase. So, I mean, there's there's some other costs that are that are built in there as well, but right. it's, it's still very attractive rates. I, I, without talking to engineers, whenever I probably think we ought to be in the 20, maybe the 25 year route just for what we want to see what the life expectancy is of um, some of the components of the garage. Um, just throwing it out there that to go 30 on um, on some of the ramps probably in particular, we'd want to have that discussion and make sure we matched up the life of the asset with how we're, how we're borrowing and paying it off. It, but it, the life of the asset would match up in terms of to be able to borrow because you're give you're you're have a leeway of I believe ten or twenty percent on I just want to make sure that we're on the same page with what the engineers look at because we're not constructing new we're taking in in rebuilding and encapsulating and I just want to make sure that um, I mean the last thing I want to do is we've we're putting more money into a garage 25 years ago and we haven't paid off an original bond yet. Um, Will so. we be disrupting any of the businesses down below at all? Oh yeah. Oh yes. I have no doubt that it would be dis disruptive uh, to first floor businesses to some extent. So there's going to be a cost value to that. Yeah. Letting the garage collapse though is even <laughs> worse. <laughs> it is. Yeah, um, it's it's a <laughs> and I, but I think it's a good point, uh, Council oh, yeah. Susie, to the extent that it's something that we might anticipate <laughs> and have some form of business interruption right. provision in there. Exactly. Uh, it just um yeah and, and and we would have it if we took it down as well if we were to deconstruct right either so, way uh, yeah unfortunately this how old is this garage built in 71 i think 71 ish 71 so, so it's got some white yeah so we're fi we're 50 years into something here that was and who paid for it 50 years ago and then taxpayers but was this a, was this part of a grant program or was this uh, something that bonded renewable. was it bonded by the city yeah, urban renewal. And, and, and originally, if you recall, and not only was the retail owned privately, one third of the actual parking spaces were owned privately on each level. Yet the city was responsible for all of the maintenance to the ramps up and down to it. Um, and we, the yeah, council, yeah. made a decision upon staff recommendation to buy out the private parking area for a dollar just so that we controlled our own destiny. And we probably did that five or six years ago, ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you could envision a scenario where somebody says, hey, I can't get to my parking spaces on the upper deck right now because you've got the ramp closed. And somebody could be saying, you need to fix that. I've got spaces up there. So at least this gives us the control over what we're choosing to do with it. Right. Councilor Hamill. Thank you. Um, 
Well, it's, it's pretty obviously obvious we've uh, come to the point where we've got to make a decision. I mean, this has been on the Land and Buildings Committee for a while now. Um, and uh, what I would like to do as chairman of that committee is to set up a um, public hearing on this for, we already got a couple for the next meeting, like Scott. So do you want to, do you want to set it up as a committee meeting, as a committee hearing, or no, do you want to move a, it in front of the, like the motions written tonight, a, a regular council meeting? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You know, it, it, at this point, I mean, the council knows what the cost is to reconstruct and to decommission the top level. We know that. So it, it's to the point now where we need to just make the decision. We can't kick the can down the road anymore. Uh, fortunately, you know, I, I, I feel bad that uh, some arrangement couldn't be made uh, to, to purchase the whole property, but that ain't going to happen. Uh, and in a way, I think if we do fix the whole thing, then I, whoever's here in the future uh, will should really stress trying to acquire the whole building or get rid of the whole thing. Uh, and not 30 years from now or 40 years from now, the people sitting here is gonna go through the same thing. So um, it, it's what we have to work with. It's not a good situation. There's no good win on this at all, the way everything is set up. Uh, but uh, we're responsible for that roof. It's been leaking for a long time. Uh, so we got we to gotta bite the bullet and, and fix it one way or the other. So I think we just should hold a public hearing as a council so everybody hears what's going on. I really don't want to do any more specific committee meetings on this. I'd rather have the full council be aware of all, uh, all, all what's being said at the same time instead of trying to have a committee meeting and then try and bring it forward to the full council. So I think it's better uh, that whatever meetings we have on this from now on and what we decide is everybody hears the same thing at the same time. I agree. I think our committee agrees on that. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what would be a good uh, time to do that? I think stuff? you do it for the 27th. You moved one to October 12th. So all you have is impact fees on for a public okay. hearing so in two I'll, weeks. So, so if, I, if I hear you correctly, Councilor Hamill, you're making a motion to schedule a public hearing on September 27th. 2021 yep. during the regular council meeting to gather public input prior to any action being taken. Correct. So, so made by Councilor Hamill, seconded by Councilor Felt. Just a further discussion on this. Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by raising your hands that six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you. Adjourn the city council meeting at 8.57 p.m. on September 13th.